It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? CBS News correspondents Larry Lesser and Walter Cronkite. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable James Roosevelt, United States Representative from California. As the saying goes, our guest tonight needs no introduction. The eldest son of the late President Roosevelt may be a freshman congressman in Washington, but few people in the United States know the inside of the White House better than he does. Congressman Roosevelt, I understand that this reception for the congressman at, uh, that President Eisenhower gave, it was like old home week in the White House for the servants, that is. Well, Larry, uh, yes, it was a little bit. <laughs> I found I knew most of the staff, and they were still there. And, of course, I was very happy to see them. And uh, we did have sort of an old home week reception. But as a matter of fact, it might interest you to know that uh, uh, I was there today for lunch also. Really? I had the privilege and the pleasure of having lunch uh, with the president today, uh, with some other congressmen who were his guests. Uh, and a, a rather amusing thing happened. Uh, it so happens that, as you know, the president has a voting residence here in New York City. Uh, and one of my fellow freshman congressmen uh, happens to be a Democrat, is his representative in the Congress. And at the same time, of course, he is about, I think, to establish a new residence uh, near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And the representative, the congressman from that district, also happens to be a French freshman congressman and a Democrat. And uh, so today he met them both. And, he, uh, he's beginning to feel a little bit like he's represented in Congress. Well, we asked him too. today whether he thought he was well represented <laughs> in the Congress. I'm not sure whether he does or not. <laughs> Does he joke about these uh, representatives of his from Gettysburg and from New York? Oh, I think the president has a very fine sense of humor. May we ask <laughs> you what he, what he told you, uh, Congressman Roosevelt? Oh, we just had a very pleasant social occasion. Oh, well, there were no state secrets <laughs> today. Incidentally, Mr. Roosevelt, uh, the uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee has uh, been denounced recently for bringing up the name of Mrs. Eisenhower in a political sense. Now, it seems to me that the name of your mother has not been neglected in the past by politicians. How did you feel about that whole incident? Well, Larry, uh, uh, I think a fair answer to that is that I, I regret always when personalities of that kind uh, enter into politics. Politics gets a little too rough sometimes. Uh, but I think in, in all honesty, the, those who are perhaps uh, uh, squawking the loudest should remember that there was an occasion, perhaps you remember it, Back uh, in a previous campaign, when a president of the United States, who happened to be my father, made the remark that it was all right to criticize him and his wife and his children, but he just didn't want his little dog, Fowler, criticized. <laughs> so I think you have to have a sense of humor about that, too. That sort of sums it up. Incidentally, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, you've been appointed to a couple of good committees since uh, you've been in Congress, although you're only a freshman, was a small business and uh, labor and education. Now, what actually are you pitching for on that uh, small business committee? Well, the Select Small Business Committee, which is appointed by the Speaker of the House, primarily uh, is a sort of a watchdog to see what can be done and how we can advise the other committees of the House. Perhaps I should say that I am on some good committees, but all committees in the House are good committees, that uh, uh, our particular committee is supposed to advise uh, these standing committees as to what is happening to small business, whether they're being swallowed up by big business or by the monopolies, and what, if any, legislation is needed to enable them to, to keep prosperous or to enable them to keep their place in our whole economic system. What is happening to small business? Are they being cannibalized and swallowed up? Well, I think in all honesty, I would have to say that from what I've seen of it so, so far, that small business is falling away, decreasing and that uh, it finds a harder time to keep pace uh, in the struggle for economic survival, and that little by little it is being squeezed out of competition. And I think that not only this Congress, but uh, the Congresses that are, are to come, must find a way to make it possible for small business to keep alive unless we want real, all-out monopoly in this country. Well, is that a natural uh, thing, or is, can it be legislated against, do you think? Yes, I think it can, to a degree, be legislated against. I think, for instance, that we must give 
small business a fair opportunity to take part in the development of atomic energy there's a real fear that that won't be allowed unless we enforce it by legislation i think also that uh... we must also see that small business has a chance through the taxation process uh... to resist the tremendous power that just wealth and the big corporations gives to them perhaps we should we'll be we'll find it's necessary to give them a tax advantage uh... as far as the corporate setup is concerned but i think above all else we need to see that the power of bigness is not used uh... to discriminate so that temporarily at least a a war uh... such as a price war is put on until they're squeezed out of business and then the prices go right back up again those are just some of the problems that we find as we in, uh, look into the si situation now mr congressman i don't think that larry's had as a guest here on chronoscope uh, very recently have you larry uh, a representative from the west coast i'd be most interested in knowing how congressman roosevelt feels about the administration policy as it's being pursued at the moment in this very delicate situation of formosa and uh, whether your views might be different coming from the west coast which is geographically spiritually in a lot of other ways closer to the situation than the other parts of the united states on this matter well i suppose that anybody who lives on the west coast feels uh, very close to the situation in the pacific i think in general that i can say that uh, we feel and hope that uh, Formosa will not be the spark which will ignite a third world war. I think that uh, by and large, uh, we trust the president. Uh, we have backed, uh, as the vote in the Congress will show, uh, the president's program for resisting any armed aggression wherever it may occur, including Formosa. However, I think there is a strong feeling in the West Coast that we should not involve ourselves in a defense of the smaller islands, islands which perhaps uh, in, in, uh, in all fairness are more a part of a true Chinese situation uh, and that these uh, islands should not be uh, so defended that they could be used as that kind of a, of a spot. Do you believe then that Senator Noland is not speaking necessarily for his constituents in the state of California when he stands for a stronger position in the Far East? I think that unquestionably Senator Nolan speaks for some people. I would doubt whether he spoke for the majority of the people uh, in the state of California or for that matter in the country. I feel that generally by and large the people want more effort made to work, a, uh, to work out a peaceful solution. The people I think want peace but they do not want peace at any price. And well, in general, I think that they will back the president in his determination to resist a solution of the Formosan problem by armed aggression. Well, Jimmy, it takes two, of course, to make any agreement. And uh, although the people back here in the East, I think, are pretty apathetic about uh, going to war for islands like Matsu and Kimoi, nevertheless, it is a fact that the the major part of uh, Jean Kai-shek's nationalist army is on those islands, and we just can't uh, see them sacrificed, even though we don't care very much about the islands. It's a question of manpower there, too, isn't it? Yes, but we, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that we help them get some of their manpower out of uh, one of the other islands. Uh, whether there is a majority of it there, I doubt. I think the majority well, is... Well, 30% of, the, of, the, of his first-class combat troops are on Kimoi and Matsu. We just can't let them be captured. No, and it may be necessary for us, for the defense of Formosa, to resist any armed attack against those two islands. But I would say that uh, uh, beyond those two islands, that there is no paramount danger to Formosa. And uh, therefore, uh, when I say Formosa, perhaps uh, it would be more proper to link those two islands. Now, that is largely a military decision. Whether to defend Formosa, we must also hold those two islands. Uh, that is being debated, as you know, in, in Washington today. And uh, if it's a military necessity, then, of course, we will help to defend them, in my opinion. If Young. it is not, I don't think we will or should. Congressman Roosevelt, I wonder if we could touch on a domestic issue here, which uh, I think interests all of us these days. Aren't you Democrats uh, who now control Congress going to be in a bit of a spot if after having... Uh, either uh, supported or permitted this Congress, which is under your control, to have voted pay raises for yourselves, you uh, turn around and don't uh, push through this $20 tax reduction for what uh, is frequently called, uh, and this includes me, the little people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, let me say, first of all, in defense of the congressman, that this is the first uh, pay increase they've had since 1938, while most of the others have had pay increases in the intermediate time. But I would agree with you 100%. I think that this Congress should back uh, a uh, tax reduction for the small income groups in this country. And I don't care whether they do it by increasing the exemption, exemptions uh, 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 of the individual taxpayers and their families, or whether they do it by a $20 or a $10 tax reduction. Well, well Jimmy, to answer my question, are you going to be in a political spot if you don't get the $20 through? Well, I think those who vote against it are going to be in a spot, but those of us who voted for it and will continue to vote for it, I don't think will be in a position. <laughs> well, good luck to you. I'd like to ask you, do you have any uh, further political ambitions? Do you intend to run for the Senate or, if I may say, so perhaps for a higher office in the future? Larry, I, I learned a long time ago in politics never to say never, but I want to tell you very frankly that I think that uh, in order to be a useful citizen, one should stay in the Congress because of the seniority system to develop your greatest potential. And I hope to be, if the people of my district will re-elect me, a member of the House of Representatives for a long time to come. Thank you very much, Dan Roosevelt. We're glad to have you here from California, though I know you spend most of your time in Washington these days. Anyway, it's good to see you. Thank you, Larry. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Walter Cronkite. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable James Roosevelt, United States Representative from California. To own a Longines is to own the world's most honored watch, the standard of excellence in 100 countries of the free world. And the reasons for the worldwide preference for Longines watches are many. To a lady, Longines offers perfect examples of the jeweler's art. Diminutive cord watches for every day. Trim strap watches for country and sport. Elegant gem quality diamond watches and bracelet watches for formal occasions. Each watch, a rare combination of beauty and excellent timekeeping. For men, there are Longines watches in equally great variety. Strap and bracelet watches for business. Longines Automatics, the most advanced in the world. Chronograph and timing watches for aviation, sport, and other technical uses. And every Longines watch, regardless of style or type, is made to the unique standards of quality which have won for Longines. Ten World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now, happily in a watch, the best costs but little more than the least. Compare a Longines watch with any other and see for yourself. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Wednesday, March the 9th, Colonel Robert Scott flew a Republic Thunderstreak from Los Angeles to New York in a record-breaking three hours, 46 minutes, and 33 seconds, timed by Longines, official watch for the National Aeronautic Association. Longines congratulates Colonel Scott and Republic Aircraft on this great achievement. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Longines extends birthday greetings to the Girl Scouts on the 43rd anniversary of this growing force for freedom. <laughs>